Fine job. In 2004, a runner, a marathoner from Brazil, traveled to Athens to do something that nobody from Brazil had ever done before, and that was to, to earn a medal in the marathon. And he was particularly excited because he was going to be running on the original marathon course that had been run 2,500 years earlier, uh, this 26.2 mile trek that had uh, kind of set the standard for the marathon all these years. And he did very well. He was out in front of the pack at the 20 mile mark when the most bizarre thing happened probably in the history of the Olympics. This gentleman who was in the crowd for some totally unbeknown reason came out of the crowd and tackled this young man from Brazil. Tackled him to the ground. And while he was on the ground, two other runners ran past him, and those two other runners would capture the gold and the silver. But the remarkable thing is that this young man uh, got up from the ground and finished the race and accomplished his goal by capturing the bronze medal and meddling in, uh, in the marathon, which was what his goal was. At the end of the whole thing, he was asked about his, if he was bitter over what happened and he said, I'm not going to cry forever about the incident, although it broke my concentration, but I managed to finish. And the bronze medal in such a difficult marathon is also a great achievement. A good attitude, considering uh, the fact that it may have cost him the gold medal. But the great thing about this runner was that he finished well. He could have stayed on the ground. He could have made, he had plenty of excuses not to finish, but he finished well in the race. Paul uses that theme of uh, running the race and uh, finishing the race well. And, uh, the, in the Bible, there are over 300 leaders that we find from Old Testament and New Testament combined. And out of those 300 leaders, I, I think it's about 55 that we find finished well at the end of their life. Only about one in six finish their life well, and others... Uh, got off course and, and crashed and burned and, and ran into other great problems. But only about one in six actually finished well. As we've been studying the life of Paul, we're going to look at the conclusion of his life, the way he indeed finished his life well and was able to say at the end of his life that he finished the race. And I want us particularly to kind of use this time to take a, a look at our own lives. Uh, for example, I wondered if if you were to be asked today that uh, as at whatever point you are in the race, if you were to be asked today how you would summarize your life, you know, here's Paul saying, I finished, I fought the good fight, I finished the race. How would you feel? How, what would you say about, about the race that you've been in, the, about the fight that you've been fighting? How would you summarize your life? I think some people would say, where did the time go? Seems like I just started this race and, and I'm already getting near the finish line. Where did the time go? Others might say, well, there have been so many missed opportunities, so much wasted time, even a number of regrets, things that I could have done or wish I had done differently. But that's not the way Paul looked at his life. And I want you to see the way he concluded his life in uh, probably the last words that he wrote in all of the books of the New Testament and the last letters he wrote were to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he said, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. He knows that he does not have long to live. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What an amazing way to summarize your life. Don't you hope that you're going to be able to say that as you know that the time of your departure is near. Don't you hope that you're going to get to that point and be able to say, I have kept the faith and I have fought the good fight and finished that race. Jesus, when he was on the cross, uttered those words that says, it is finished. And he knew that even in that short time that he had on this earth, he'd accomplished everything that God had for him to do. And Paul, when he says, I have finished the race, had that same 
reassurance in his own heart that he had accomplished everything that God had given him to do. I don't know many people who have that kind of peace of mind when they get to the end of their lives as he has. Do you know what Paul focused on in the final days and weeks and months of his life? He knew that the time was getting near. He knew he didn't have much, more, much time to live. What would he do with those last few weeks and months that he had in his life? He focused those last few days on training Timothy, on making a disciple is what he did. He reproduced himself in someone else. After my father died, my brother David took over his um, advertising agency, the marketing company that he ran. And he cleared out my father's desk and he found this uh, day timer. Remember day timers in the, in the old days? where he actually used pens and paper, if you remember those. Uh, and he had a date timer by Stephen Covey, a very, very well-respected uh, uh, business uh, person. And on, on one page on his date timer, uh, Stephen Covey had asked a question. And the question was, what can you do to make the greatest impact on the world? And my father had written on that page, the way I can make the greatest impact on the world is, by helping others to succeed? It's a good answer. If I help others to succeed, I can make a great impact on the world. And at his funeral, a number of people, and at, at the wake the night before, a number of people came up to me and they told me that they were clients of my father. But he didn't just advertise for them, he helped them to succeed. He, he taught them how to be better at their business and they were better at what they did. They were more successful because of their relationship with my father. So he accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. He helped others to succeed and he made an impact on the world. Paul knew that in the few days he had left, the most important thing he could do was to help Timothy to succeed. This young preacher, he wanted to pour all of his wisdom and experience into this young man and help him to be a powerful testimony for Jesus Christ. And, and he wrote these two wonderful books to, to Timothy, and he just poured out so much of his life to him. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he said to, he said to him, the things you have heard from me, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So do you see how this chain is continuing? He is handing this truth down to Timothy because he knows that Timothy is going to be able to, able to teach other people. And he tells Timothy to do the same things. Entrust these to reliable people who will be able to teach others. And so that chain continues and continues even down to this day. Paul met Timothy when he was on one of his missionary journeys. He actually describes that in, in the book of Acts, in Acts 16. He said, uh, Luke is writing this, said, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where he met a disciple named Timothy, or where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer and whose father was a Greek. Now we know that Timothy not only had a godly mother, but he had a godly grandmother, because Paul writes about that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. He said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. I know that many of you had uh, godly mothers, and, and some had godly grandmothers. And those of us who did are very thankful for that, that they passed that heritage of faith. Others of you did not. But maybe others of you get to be that, that godly person who hands down that faith to your children and your grandchildren and starts that chain that, like Timothy had. In fact, Paul goes on to say about Timothy that in 2 Timothy 3.15, he said, I know how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. He's saying that Timothy has known the Holy Scriptures from infancy. Apparently, his grandmother and mother didn't want to wait too long before they started teaching him. So when he was an infant, they began to teach him the Scriptures. 
Uh, you can never start too early with a child to teach them God's word. And we know that, uh, that responsibility lies first in the parents. You know, Sunday schools are a wonderful thing, but one of the, one of the downsides, perhaps, of Sunday school over the years was that a lot of parents sort of uh, abdicated their responsibility and decided that the Sunday school will teach my kids uh, the, the Bible. So I'll just, I'm just going to take them to Sunday school, and that's, that's my job. I'm going to take them, and I'm going to let somebody else teach them. Well, I'd say that's better than nothing, but the best is for the parents to teach them and the, for the parents to, to teach them not only what the Scripture says, but then to, to model that for the, parent, for the child at the same time so that your actions and your words speak powerfully to the children. And that's what happened to Timothy. His grandmother and his mother, they taught him and they modeled their faith, and he became a strong and powerful Christian. So Paul writes these two letters to Timothy, and he's going to pass on to him the lessons that he has learned in a lifetime of serving Christ. And I, think, I find about five spiritual lessons that Paul is going to pass on to Timothy. And the first one that he passes on to him is really the source of strength, where all of this comes from. He's going to teach him that the strength that you need for ministry comes from God. Don't rely on your own strength for ministry or you're going to run out really fast. But the strength that you're going to need is going to come from God. You see that in, uh, this, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to follow that chapter through here and look at these lessons. He says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I think it's really important that he didn't just say, uh, you know, be strong out, Timothy. You know, rely on your strength and be strong and go out there and be a powerful witness. He said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's where your strength is coming from. Your strength is coming from Christ. And that's, that's where you need to be strong. Even Paul knew that even when he was weak, Christ was strong through him. In fact, when Paul was at his weakest with that mysterious kind of thorn in his side, God said, my, my strength is made perfect in you when you're weak. So you don't have to have all kinds of physical strength or emotional strength when you're to be a, a, a witness and a, a minister for Christ. You just know, need to know where the strength comes from and rely upon that strength that's coming from, from Christ. Florence Nightingale, at the end of her career, people were talking about how much she accomplished uh, as, a, as a young woman uh, going into this field of nursing, how she just revolutionized the whole field and how much she accomplished. And this is, was her conclusion. She said, if I could give you information of my life, it would be to show you how a woman of very ordinary ability has been led by God to strange and unaccustomed paths that do in his service what he has done in her. And if I could tell you all, you would see how God has done all and I nothing. That's how she concluded her life. God did all of it through me. I didn't do anything. God did it through me. I think Paul would say the same thing at the end of his life. Everything that he accomplished was the power of God working through him. That they, nothing was accomplished in his own strength. And that's the first thing he tells Timothy, is to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The second little bit of advice that he gives him in, in the same chapter is to avoid distractions. Because it, with everybody in ministry, there are all kinds of distractions that are going to come along. Some are very good, by the way. Some are programs and projects that are very good things that you can do. But they're not the main thing for you to do. They're not the thing God's called you to do. So he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he says, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And I love the fact that he doesn't sugarcoat what ministry is. Because Paul suffered a lot in his ministry. We studied that the last couple of weeks. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He says, join with me in suffering. But he said, like a good soldier in Christ Jesus. Then he says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled with civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So it's a picture of a soldier, and he's in the middle of a war, and he's got one person that he answers to, and that's his commanding officer. And it doesn't matter what anybody else wants. 
So if you can kind of picture our American soldiers as they were trying to liberate France and as they are working their way kind of village by village through France, pushing the Nazis back into Germany, as they would go through these villages, you could imagine that there might have been people there who would have said, well, could you help me rebuild my house or could you help me uh, fix this well or, or with my garden or anything else? And it might have been very good things that the soldiers were being asked to do, but they had a commanding officer so they didn't get involved in civilian affairs because they had a war to win. And the only person whose opinion mattered was their commanding officer. They had to please him. And Paul says, we're the exact same way. We have a commanding officer. You have a commanding officer. And that officer is, is Jesus Christ. You answer to God alone. And other people might ask you to get involved in these projects, and they might be good projects. But your goal is to please God and to do what God has called you to do. And avoid those distractions that are going to take you away from doing the most important thing. The third thing that Paul teaches Timothy is to be disciplined. An awful lot of these, the, those leaders that I talked about who did not finish well, for so many of them it was because of lack of discipline in their lives. And in 2 Timothy 2.5 he said, Similarly, I mean, he's just used an example of a soldier. And he said, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Now, Paul was very familiar with the Olympics. It had been going on before Paul, and uh, he knew about the Olympics. And the, the, the main event of the Olympics was that marathon that I've already mentioned. And he knew that it didn't matter how fast you ran in that race, if you deviated from the course, you would be disqualified. In fact, there are people who have tried to do that. Uh, in fact, if you ask any uh, marathoner, anybody who, is, who has run a lot of marathons, who's, who is really interested in that sport, and if you talk about, you say, uh, ask them who is a, who's a, who cheated, who's, who's somebody who has cheated in the marathon, the name that comes immediately to them is Rosie Ruiz. 35 years later, Rosie Ruiz is the one they think of. Because in 1980, in the Boston Marathon, she won the women's marathon. She was crowned the winner, and she, was, she, was, she kept all of the, her awards and the accolades for eight days. It took them eight days to go over the pictures of the course and discover that she was nowhere to be seen in the first 10 miles. She hopped in in the middle of the race, way ahead of the other women, and she ran fast for the end of the race, and she won the race she didn't really win the race, she cheated. She didn't win the whole race. She just took all of that glory upon herself and then she was stripped of her crown and stripped of all of that. As, as Paul says, um, the, victor, the, it, the athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by a competing according to the rules. She didn't compete according to the rules so she didn't win the victor's crown and of course the woman who finished right behind her was eventually awarded the champion, the, the, first place for that Boston Marathon. There are a lot of, um, Paul warned Timothy to be disciplined so he wouldn't be disqualified. It's, uh, there are many leaders, many Christians who have been disqualified because they weren't disciplined, because they, they deviated from the course, they ran off the path, they followed their own way rather than God's way. Timothy continues to talk a little bit about this athletic pursuit when he says in in first timothy 4 verses 7 and 8 he said train yourself to be godly for physical training is of some value but godliness has value for all things holding promise to both the present life and the life to come uh, we live in a world where people are obsessed with physical fitness and there are gyms everywhere and there's people who are involved in all kinds of physical programs and they're those are good things they make people healthier and that helps them to live longer and be more productive. All of those are good things. And he says it's a good thing. Uh, physical training is of some value. But training in godliness, now that is of value not only in this life but the life to come. And so he talks to Timothy about being disciplined in his training, particularly his training in godliness. The fourth lesson that he teaches Timothy is to let the Bible be your guide. The Bible has to be our, our primary guide through this lifetime, and that's true of every Christian. 
And in order for that guide, you don't need to know what is in it. You need to read it and study it. Just like if you were traveling somewhere and you were handed a map, and again, I, this is showing my age because nobody today uses maps. You just tell your phone to get you there and your phone takes you there. But in the old days, you had to unfold this big map and say, I'm starting here and I want to end up there. And you have to follow the roads and all the turns to get there. And you had to study that map if you weren't going to get lost. And the Bible is that road map that you have to study it if you're going to get to where you're going to go. So Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed but who, and who correctly handles the word of truth. I love that phrase, one who correctly handles the word of truth. When I was in seminary and I was being taught hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible, and homiletics, how to preach the Bible, the one thing that our professor kept repeating over and over again was learn how to correctly handle the word of truth. And I've taken it very seriously because I believe that there are many people who are very careless in the way they handle God's word. People who will tend to teach it uh, sort of like this, to say, well, what this verse means to me is, and I want to say to that person, I don't really care what it means to you. I want to know what, it, what God intended it to mean. I want to know what, what it meant to Paul or what it meant to Christ, and I don't care what it means to you. I want to know what God intended it to mean. So that's what it means to handle the word of God uh, carefully, is to, to study it correctly so you know what was the intended meaning. What did God intend for us to hear when he... When he inspired these words to be written? Do we have a high view of God's scripture that we really believe that it was inspired by God and that it's authoritative in our lives and that it's without error in its original language? Do we believe that? And if so, we need to handle it with truth, with very carefully. We can't be those kind of people who say, somewhere in the Bible it says something about God helps those who help themselves. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. But people say that, and then others listening go, oh, yeah, that's really deep. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't be one of those people that says, oh, I think somewhere it might say this. That's not handling the, God, uh, the word of God carefully. That's being very casual with God's word. The other thing that happens so often with people is they and I think it's the most common mistake made in using God's word, is that they take a phrase or a word or a sentence or even a verse out of the context in which it is written and they apply it to their life or their circumstance or to their sermon. I, I knew a, a gentleman who preached like this. He would, um, he would have a, a theme that he wanted to preach on. So let's say that, that this day he's preaching on how um, that that all of, us should, all of us should be missionaries, that that's what God wants all of you to be missionaries. And so he would take 10, 10 verses out of the Bible, all different books and sections of the Bible, and some of them weren't even complete verses, sometimes just half a verse because that fit better what he wanted to say. And he would just rattle through these verses so fast, it wouldn't even give references as to where they were from. And many people listening would just say, wow, that's overwhelming evidence that the Bible's saying that. But it wasn't because he, some of those verses had nothing to do with being a missionary. Because I would be sitting there looking them up and going, that's not talking about being a missionary. See, that's not handling God's word carefully. That's using God's word to accomplish your purpose, to make God's word say what you want it to say. And that's not the way God's word is to be handled. So he tells him to handle God's word correctly. The fifth thing that he tells Timothy is to stay away from temptation. And he says it in the most clear language it could be said. In 2 Timothy 2.22, he says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He, he uses two verbs here. Um, these are Im imperative sentences. An imperative sentence has an implied you. So the, the, the subject of this sentence, this is a quick grammar lesson. I know you love grammar. 
the quick grammar lesson here is that the subject of this sentence, if you're diagramming it, is, is you, the word you. And you're saying, but the word you isn't in there. But it's the implied you of an imperative sentence. So he's saying, you flee evil desires of your youth, and you pursue righteousness. Two verbs. You flee. Run away from temptation. Get away from it. Get as far away from it as you can. Because the danger of a lot of people today is they want to see how close they can get without falling. So let's dabble with it and let's play with it and let's see how close we can get. And he says, no, that's not the way to deal with temptation. The way to deal with temptation is get as far away from it as you can. Flee temptation and the evil desires of your youth. And then he says, pursue. So you're supposed to run away from that, but you're supposed to pursue righteousness. You're supposed to run, run after righteousness and faith and love and peace. It reminds me of when he says, think on these things things that are pure and that are good and that are holy and godly. Think on those things. Pursue those things and stay away from all those other things. And he's warning young Timothy here to, to stay away from temptation. A group of forest rangers were horrified one day out in California when they heard this crashing, this thunderous crashing sound that was unmistakable. They knew what it was and it was the sound of a redwood that was crashing to the ground. These beautiful, gigantic redwood trees. They heard the crashing sound from miles away, and they all rushed to the scene to see what was going on. They were afraid that it was some vandals that had cut down one of these uh, the wonderful trees that are so many thousands of years old. When they got there, though, there was no sign that anybody had tampered with it. There was no saws, there was no saw marks in here. There was no sign that it had been hit by lightning or had blown over by a storm or, or there was a fire or any, any explanation for it until they looked closely at the trunk of the tree where it had fallen and they looked inside the tree and they discovered that the tree had been destroyed not by man but by thousands of tiny beetles that had worked their way through the outside of this tree and gotten into the core of the tree and over years' time had eaten away at the core of it and rotted it so much that eventually it brought down that huge, massive tree. The same thing happens with Christians. There are Christians who fall all the time. And oftentimes it's because of this uh, internal rot that has been going on for a long period of time. So Jesus says you don't tolerate sin in your life because if you tolerate it, it's gonna destroy you in the end. And Paul says, I mean, Paul says to Timothy, just run away from those evil desires and pursue righteousness instead. So Paul spent the last portion of his life focusing on this young man, reproducing himself in a young man, because he knew that when he was not going to be around anymore, that this man could carry on the ministry that he once had, and he wanted to wanted to help that man to be successful in ministry. Most of us know the name of Sir Henry Stanley. He was a, a, a Welsh journalist and he was an explorer who was famous for his explore, explorations in Central Africa and particularly for his search for this missionary who had kind of gone missing out there in Africa named David Livingston. And it was in the late 1800s. He, uh, he was famous for, for the line that everybody quotes when he finally found David Livingstone, Livingstone and, and said, uh, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. That's his famous line. Well, he stayed with Dr. Livingstone after he found him for some time, and the strong faith of Dr. Livingstone just amazed Henry Stanley. And later, this is what he would write. He would say, for months after we met, I found myself listening to him Wandering, wondering at the old man who carried out the words, leave everything and follow me. Little by little, seeing his piety, his gentleness, his zeal, and his earnestness, I was converted by him, although he had not tried to do it. So David Livingston just lived his Christian faith in front of Henry Stanley. And his life was so powerful that Henry Stanley was converted just by the power of a, of a transformed life. 
That's what Paul was doing with Timothy. From the time he met him on that missionary journey, Timothy would travel with him, and he would live his faith in front of him. And that transformed life of Paul so impacted Timothy that Timothy would be, not only be converted to Christ, but he would become a powerful witness for Christ, and he would pass that on to reliable men and women who could teach others. And that chain continues even to this day. So that Paul, when he got to the end of his life, he could say, I have finished the race. I've, I've accomplished everything that, that God put me here to do. I have fought the good fight. And perhaps most importantly, I have kept the faith. Those are the words I want to speak at the end of my life. I hope that all of you, at the, when you reach the end of your life, that you're going to be able to say those words. Now, I have to say, I have a long way to go. And there's a lot in order, you know, for me to be able to say those words. I feel like there's, there's much to be done and a lot to do. And you probably do too. But I think if you follow these instructions of Paul, and you follow these instructions to Timothy, if you depend on the Lord for your strength, not your own strength, if you avoid the distractions, and there's so many of them more than ever today, if you're disciplined and you hold to that discipline so you don't go off the path, if you let the Bible be your guide and handle it with respect, and if you run from temptations and pursue righteousness, then perhaps one day we can all say together, I finished the race, I fought the good fight, and I've kept the faith. Let's pray together. Lord, I'm so thankful for the example of Paul and for the difficulties that he ran into time after time after time and how he learned to depend upon you through all of those things. Lord, I praise you for his example to Timothy and to all of us. I pray that you will help each of us, Lord, to, to follow those, those lessons that Paul taught, but also to duplicate ourselves in another person, to, to disciple somebody else, to pass on the things that you've taught us to somebody else who will be able to teach others. So we thank you, Father, for our faith, and we ask you to keep us strong and keep our, keep our eyes fixed upon you, that we don't deviate from the course. We pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.